Balloons, bazookas, boob, boobies, bosoms, boulders, cans, hooters, knockers, melons, honkers, jugs, rack, tatas, tits, torpedoes, guns, bust, doorknobs, coconuts, and our favorite one, the girls. Welcome to the All About Breastfeeding Show, where your host, Lori, highlights mothers just like yourself and goes beyond the surface questions and digs deep so they share not only their joys and happiness in their daily breastfeeding life, but also their pain and struggles and how they worked through them. Episode number 205. Welcome to All About Breastfeeding, the place where the girls hang out. I am your host, Lori Jolizenstadt. IBCLC, which stands for International Board Certified Lactation Consultant, and I spend my days helping moms with breastfeeding. If you would like to learn more about the services I provide, all you need to do is go to allaboutbreastfeeding.biz. In Season 6 of All About Breastfeeding, We have been working our way through the theme for Season 6 FAQs titled Birth Matters. Where you give birth, how you give birth, when you give birth, who you give birth with, it all has an impact on our breastfeeding journey. A very quick recap of the previous shows in this series titled Birth Matters. We have Episode 195 on Postpartum Hemorrhage, 197 on premature birth, 199 on birth trauma, episode 201 on interventions, episode number 203, who you give birth with, and today's episode number 205, paying homage to the title, Birth Matters. This particular show is exactly about that, Birth Matters. All throughout my career as a childbirth educator, birth and postpartum doula, and now an IBCLC, I am often asked, why does birth really matter? Isn't all we care about is that the mom gives birth to a healthy baby and that they're both fine? Well, really now, that is a hard question to answer because of course we care that the mom gives birth to a healthy baby, and of course we care that they're both fine. However, like many things in life, It is not just as simple as an answer as that. That would be like saying, you were accepted to the school of your dreams and now your life is set for success. Well, we all know that's not true. A lot can happen in between being accepted. We know it is just the beginning of all of your hard work. Or you fall in love and you live happily ever after. Again, in this case, we all know this is not true. A lot can happen in between falling in love and happily ever after is a long, long time. And we all know that it takes a lot of hard work to keep a relationship going strong. I can give you many more analogies. However, you see my point. Getting pregnant is just the beginning of many things to come and how you labor and give birth absolutely matters. As I was doing some research for this show, I was reminded of a book I have in my lending library. It is called Birth Matters, A Midwife's Manifesta. The author is Ina Mae Gaskin, who is a midwife that I have known about for years. I read cover to cover many of her books And probably her most known one is Spiritual Midwifery, and it is one of the few books on childbirth that I have read several times. Ina Mae Gaskin has been very active in the birthing world for many years. She's a prolific book author and a sought-after speaker. After perusing through this book again, I decided that I would like to share some of her thoughts with you as her information is useful and relevant to all. I agree with Ina Mae when she says, the ways in which women experience birth have implications for us all. She wrote the book in 2011, and here are some of the statistics she quoted at the time, which are not too much different than they are now in 2017. A woman who gives birth in the United States today is more likely to die in childbirth than her mother was. 
With one in three babies born via C-section, the United States ranks behind 33 other nations in neonatal mortality rates and 40 other nations in maternal mortality rates. Just let that sink in for a few minutes. The result? Confidence in women's bodies and women's choices has been lost. This speaks to our confidence to labor, to birth, to breastfeed, and to mother our babies. I speak to countless new mothers every single week. Yes, every single week. And here is what they're telling me over and over and over again. Some are using almost the same exact words, totally unsolicited. New mothers are telling me, as the tears are rolling down their cheeks, that they are feeling like their bodies have failed them in labor and birth. What does this mean? Well, very simply put, this means they went into birth with a plan, not necessarily thinking everything was going to be perfect, however, never anticipating feeling war-torn afterwards. What does this mean to breastfeeding? Well, this usually translates to a huge lack of confidence when it comes to breastfeeding. They start to look towards others to tell them what to do. Asking for help is fine. However, it seems they've lost the ability to trust their own intuition, to trust their gut. This can be devastating and quite harmful for the new mother when it comes to breastfeeding. I know this is how many mothers feel. I know this because this is what they tell me. I also know this based on my own personal experience. I felt like I started out confident and that it was shaken to the core after my first birth. I will talk about this later in the show. Here are some very common examples of interactions and conversations I've had with new mothers on any given day. A very common scenario would be this mom and baby that I work with. Baby Jordan was gaining well initially, not only back to birth weight at two weeks old, but half a pound more. This is wonderful news as Jordan is exclusively breastfed and gaining really well. However, his mom Lisa is coming to see me because at last weight check at six weeks old, her baby was not gaining as well and she just doesn't understand why. And she's so worried that her supply is too low and not meeting her baby's needs. And I ask her, why do you think you don't have enough milk for your baby? And Lisa says, well, he used to be satisfied after feedings and go right to sleep or just be content to hang out. And now he is thrashing around. I feel like he's bobbing up and down, chewing on my neck and fingers as I'm trying to burp him. And he just doesn't seem to settle down. So I wonder, is he hungry? Is he gassy? I don't know. So I ask her, well, how do you usually go about feeding him? Do you let him fall asleep when he wants to and wake up when he wants to? And Lisa said, yeah, pretty much. And then I asked her, do you usually offer one breast per feeding or both? Do you have a routine? Well, she will tell me what she has been doing. And Lisa and other moms will usually start off by saying they started off by offering both sides. This, they say, is what they learned in class or they read in a book or they just intuitively felt like it was right. They felt like they had more milk on the other side. Their baby was still kind of looking around and active and smacking their lips. So they offered the other side. But then for some moms, they're told by a medical provider or someone else that they should only offer one side. And in Lisa's case, she was told by her pediatrician she should only offer one side because her baby is gaining too much weight and they don't want to overfeed their baby. Some are also told their baby isn't gaining enough and they want their baby to stay on one side to get all the hind milk. Not that I have ESP or anything, but being that this is a common scenario, this is pretty much what Lisa told me and what other moms tell me on both ends of the spectrum. They're either told to keep their baby on one side because they're overfeeding them or because they're not gaining enough. Since Lisa's baby was gaining over and above expectations, she was told she needed to be careful to not overfeed her baby and it was suggested she only offer one breast per feeding. So I said to her, 
Mm, you know, I could appreciate the advice you were given. However, I believe each mom and baby pair is unique. Perhaps your baby does need both sides to be full. When your baby is sucking on your shoulder and fingers, have you tried to go back to offering both sides? Lisa said, no, I keep thinking maybe he's crying because maybe he's gassy or needs to be burped or overtired or overstimulated. Since he's more than he should be as far as weight, I really haven't been thinking that he's hungry, but there's part of me that thinks maybe he is. So I made this appointment because I just don't know anymore and I want to find out, am I overfeeding him or does he need more? Since I've never done this before, I'm assuming that the doctor is right. I just want to do the right thing. I said, let's go back to the thinking that every mom and baby pair is unique. Whether or not your baby needs one side or both depends on how much milk you have and how efficient your baby is at the breast. And quite frankly, it also depends from one feeding to the other. Babies do not always want the exact same amount of food at every single feeding. They tend to eat more at some times of the day and less at another time of the day. And I go on to explain to Lisa, other people, well, they have good intentions and there usually are some nuggets of truth to what they've told you, as well as some truth to what you've read. However, I really want you to begin to connect with your beautiful baby. Let's try and think together about what your baby's behavior is telling you. You said that you came in because you thought Jordan might be hungry. Based on what you've told me, it sounds like you might be right. I usually find that your baby also can tell us if we're willing to experiment a bit and try and learn what he is telling us. Are you willing to experiment a bit, Lisa? And she said, yeah. So I suggested that she feed Jordan from one side. Before Jordan feeds, I've weighed her baby. While she is feeding, if there are any adjustments that we can make with the latch to make things more comfortable for her or for her baby, we'll go over all that too. As the feeding goes on, I will answer and talk about anything else related to normal newborn feeding behaviors, feeding frequency, normal output, normal weight gain. Once her baby is done with one side, I will ask her, Lisa, how do you think he looks? Does he look like he has a full belly? Does he look content? Perhaps, do you think Jordan wants a little more? You're not sure? While Lisa is thinking about all this, I weigh her baby so I can get an idea on how much her baby took. Almost always her baby is eager to take the other side. Even if he seemed okay after one side, if he took a lot less than I would expect him to have taken, I will ask her if she would consider offering the other side. I just wanted to share a little info with you, my listeners, first. I like to weigh babies before and after a feeding. This can be a good learning tool for mom. Here is a common scenario. A weight check tells me that her baby took only half a feeding from one side only. Putting him to the other side, he goes with eagerness, relaxes into the feeding, and when he slides off the breast, moms have a huge smile on their face, saying this is how he used to look after feeding. And here is where I get to talk to the mom about the approximate amount her baby should be taking in based on his age and weight. I share with Lisa what Jordan weighed at the beginning of the feeding, what he took from the first side, and what he took from the second side. Usually in this scenario, moms can now see and they now realize that their baby is only getting a half a feeding and needs both sides. This scale helps me to show this to moms rather than me just telling her. So I combine what this scale says, how her baby is acting, and I really want her to begin to key into learning what her baby's hunger cues are. Lisa can now see that her baby has only been getting half a feeding. She's been mistaking hunger cues for possible gas, reflux, overfeeding. This is very easy to do, particularly for new mothers who have not done this job before. As new mothers, we have a very steep learning curve. I also explained to her, I can understand why she felt that way because in the very early first week or two, 
her baby Jordan did seem to be very happy and full and content with one side. And I explained to her that more than likely his belly was smaller and the volume that he needed was less. But as time goes on, his belly stretches and he wants more. And this is why we need to not be so stringent with one side or both sides or feeding frequency, waking their baby up every X amount of hours, only letting them stay on one side for so many minutes. We need to start learning our baby's hunger cues and satiation cues. Lisa is now beginning to understand, and yet she expresses a concern most mothers do when they have a consult with me. What should she do when she leaves the consult? After all, she says, here, I can see on this scale. I get it what you're saying. But at her home, I have no idea what he took. And so I review with her the hunger cues, satiation cues, and what I call the need to experiment cues. In other words, if you're not sure, and it's okay to not be sure, it's expected, you haven't done this before. Well, when you're not sure, it never hurts. It doesn't cost you anything to offer the other side. Breastfeeding moms have lots of fun sayings, and one of them is, when in doubt, just take it out. <laughs> or open up the refrigerator and see if he wants some more food. While Lisa's verbal feedback is telling me that she's getting the message, she's understanding what I'm saying, and she's willing to experiment, she still has a worried look on her face, one that I'm very familiar with. I'm feeling like she logically understands the information, but is still afraid to trust her own judgment. And I have a good idea where this is coming from. I asked her how her birth was. Did she have a vaginal birth? Did she have a cesarean? Was her baby born close to due date? And then I asked her a few other questions about her birth, and then I just let her talk. Lisa said she had specific plans for how it would go, and instead, things changed during her labor. She had to not only abandon her whole birth plan, she talked about how awful she felt about how she was treated. She felt she was not presented with choices. When she made the suggestions, she was told that she was not the expert. They had been doing this for years. Her birth experience left her feeling depressed and with a lack of confidence. As she said to me, they're right. I realized I never had a baby before, so it makes sense to follow what I'm told. The last thing I want to do is cause harm to my baby, which is also why she stopped fighting to have her voice heard during her labor. She could not stand the guilt if something bad were to have happened to her baby. She is following the expert's advice, even if it doesn't seem right to her, because she's afraid of taking that responsibility on her own. What if something should happen? She just could not live with the guilt. I feel that there are many actions that we need to have balance with. I have spent many hours with several hundred women during their labors. I have observed that rarely decisions need to be made as an emergency. And often there is ample opportunity to have a discussion with the parents and offer them options as the labor progresses. In facilitating all the postpartum groups that I have, there are a few observations that I've noted. And these observations are made loud and very clear to me. Mothers may not be happy with how their birth went. They may not be happy when they needed to transfer from a home birth or a birthing center birth to the hospital. They may not be happy that the midwife they chose in the hospital with the birthing suite they chose did not result in the birth that they desired. They will grieve for the birth they dreamed of. However, what I've learned and what mothers have shown me quite clearly is that if they felt listened to, respected, if they felt they had a certain amount of control in the decisions that were made, they were spoken to clearly and felt they understood what was happening, that in the end, when their birth was over and their baby was born, they're left for the most part feeling okay with it all. They are feeling cared for and respected. They don't stay for too long hung up on whether they had a vaginal birth with medication, a cesarean section, or IVs or medication that they didn't want. 
Their confidence is not broken and they are whole. They go into mothering with a fair amount of confidence in their body and their ability to take care of their baby. This translates to the decisions they make about breastfeeding and who they listen to and how much of their own intuition they take into consideration when making decisions. I know this not only from all the moms I've worked with, I know this from personal experience. I was a good little doobie during my pregnancy. My doctor referred me to Carol, who gave a series of classes that covered childbirth, breastfeeding, and infant care. I made sure I attended all the classes, did all the homework that I was told. I listened. And because I was a secretary at the time, and I knew shorthand, I took excellent notes. My husband and I practiced the breathing exercises, reviewed several times when to go to the hospital, and other key points that I needed to remember during my labor. When I arrived at the hospital because I was leaking fluids, the clock started, and it was only afterwards that I realized I was doomed before I started. The rules are that you have to give birth within a certain amount of hours of your water breaking. I now needed to have an IV and be in bed to monitor closely. There went my ability to walk around and change positions as I needed to. I was a pretty bad patient though. I would take the monitoring belts off whenever the staff left the room. I would pee in the toilet rather than the bedpan they wanted me to. And I insisted on walking around and I kept getting shooed back to bed. I have a long story, which I will share another time. I just want you to know that I had to fight for what I wanted during my labor. Some things I got and others I was voted down. And yes, I do mean voted down. Fighting. I had to fight for sitting up during labor. I had to fight for more than ice chips during labor. I just wanted to sip. I want to take a big gulp of water. Fighting to say no to a forceps delivery, and on and on. It was horrible. I literally felt war torn. At one point, they told me I needed to have a cesarean as my baby was just not going to come out. I had been pushing for a long time, and this was just not going to happen, I was told. One day on this show, I will share my whole birth story, but for right now, I will tell you that I did have a vaginal birth, unmedicated and she was just fine. This was my first inkling though, that the providers didn't always know best and that even the idea of a cesarean could have been brought up differently rather than to have one without any discussion. Once my beautiful baby Alicia was born, they wanted to separate us because she had swallowed the little fluid. I had to fight to keep her close to me, but they wanted to bring her to the nursery and I did have that guilt, like what if something really is wrong? So I let them take her to the nursery. They didn't want me to breastfeed her, but they wanted me to give her a bottle of sugar water because they said this is what she needed. I couldn't bear to do it myself, so I gave my husband the bottle. We were in the nursery. I swear I had my name blacklisted for being a bad hospital patient. And now in the nursery, I swear they were on high alert with me as they watched us like a hawk. I pulled the curtains around us, gave my husband the bottle. He tried to feed her, but she made all kinds of faces. You know, the ones that when you have something really tart, well, that's what she looked like. They came and they watched around the curtain and told us to keep trying when I said she didn't want it. Once they left us alone for another few minutes, when I realized that they were on one side of the curtain, not watching us, I said to my husband, turn the bottle upside down, squeeze the nipple and let it leak out a little bit. We did. <laughs> and when they came back, they were all smiles, seeing that she took some water from the bottle. Well, I'm not happy here to say or proud to say that I lied, but once they think she took the bottle and they said she was doing great, well, that was another sign to me that perhaps they don't always know what's best and perhaps there is some balance here. As my experience grew with moms and labor and birth and breastfeeding, I kept coming back to my birth. I realized that rather than taught how to work with my body during labor, 
I was basically prepped on how to be a good hospital patient. I learned that the volume of fluid that Alicia swallowed was minimal. And there were other things that I could have done, other things that could have been done and suggested rather than separate us and demand I give her sugar water for her first feeding. My response to all this, while I was getting the message that the healthcare provider didn't know it at all, I was still quite vulnerable as a new mom. I shied away from speaking up when I had questions or a different opinion. This created a bad situation where I pushed aside my intuition. I stuffed it. I didn't value it much. And I began to think others were the experts. It took me a good six months to recognize that I was a partner along with the providers in my baby's health care and that my questions and concerns were valid, they were important, they should be respected and listened to. There are many reasons that I love hosting the All About Breastfeeding podcast. One of my favorite reasons for doing so is to let all my listeners know that while you may not know everything there is about birth and babies and breastfeeding, you have an inherent knowledge that comes from within. You are smart, intelligent, have good intuition, and you must not let anyone make you feel as if they are any more of an expert about your baby than you are. Ask questions, seek advice and help. Because for many of us, it does take a village. We don't want to be mothering alone. We also want to be heard and respected for the knowledge and intuition and thoughts we already have long before our baby is born. Do not stuff your intuition away so deep that you forget how important you are to your baby. Your baby needs you to trust in yourself. Anna DeFranco said, birth is the epicenter of woman's power. For many of us, we do not realize how important our birth will be to us. How this intimate experience is something we will remember for all of our lives. Birth matters. How and where and with whom you give birth. I encourage all all my listeners to take an active part in their pregnancy. Learn all you can about how to work along with your caregivers to have the healthiest pregnancy. Do all you can during your labor to ensure that you are part of the important decisions that are made as your labor unfolds. Labor is something you do not have total control over, and yet there is much that you actually can control. Make sure you've surrounded yourself with people who are not only knowledgeable about birth, share your philosophy, but who respect the laboring mother and all the wisdom she brings to her birth. Every day as I go about doing my work and visiting with new mothers, I always hope that each new visit with a mom leads me to a mom who feels good about her birth experience. I know how far this positive feeling goes as she begins new motherhood and her breastfeeding experience. I long for every new mother to know and understand how powerful of a force they are and how much their instincts will play a part in their breastfeeding and mothering. Barbara Katz said, birth is not only about making babies, birth is about making others, mothers strong, competent, capable, mothers who trust themselves and now their inner strength. I just love that quote. Birth is not only about making babies, birth is about making mothers strong, competent, capable mothers who trust themselves and now their inner strength. I think that would be a great affirmation to have around during your late pregnancy. If you enjoy this show, you know what I say, don't let it be your best kept secret. I hear from many women who tell me they are binging on the All About Breastfeeding podcast. And my regular listeners know this is music to my ears. I put a lot of work into it. And I love the fact that you're getting a lot of good stuff from it. Don't keep it to yourself. Share this show with your pregnant friends, new mothers, or anyone else you know who could benefit from this great free information. Send them a link 
or download this podcast on their phone so they can listen to it and binge on it whenever it's convenient for them. I know I wish I had all this knowledge before I gave birth to my first baby and entered into newborn mothering and first time breastfeeding. I know for sure I would have had a better experience. Join our Facebook group by searching for these four words, all about breastfeeding community. Make sure you put the word community in there, otherwise it leads you to a different page. I look forward to sharing the next interview with you next week with a mom that's a member of our Facebook community. How exciting. Everyone's breastfeeding experience is not the same. And my guest next week will let many of you know that you are not alone. Until the next show, bye-bye.